gives me a great pleasure to welcome you to our second webinar to celebrate Nursing in the Community Week. Nurses where you need them on this really auspicious day, Are You OK Day. I trust that we've all been able to check in with our loved ones, friends and colleagues today. In the spirit of reconciliation, Australian College of Nursing acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to elders past, present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Next slide please. We also would like to acknowledge and thank our sponsors. Uh, Regal Health, founding sponsor for 55 years, Regal has been matching the skills and expertise of their nurses to what matters and the community ex exceptional home care. Medibank is a leading private health insurer with more than 50 sorry, 45 years of experience delivering better health care to Australians. Medicare also delivers a range of health services in Australia with almost 2,000 clinical and non-clinical employees, making a difference to the health and well-being of millions of Australians every year. ACNA, the Australian Primary Healthcare Association is the peak body and professional membership association for all nurses working outside of a hospital setting in Australia. And Smith & Nephew is a leading portfolio medical technology company operating in around 100 countries globally. They exist to restore people's bodies and their self-belief. Their focus areas are orthopedics, sports medicine and advanced wound management. Next slide, please. And just a word from our founding sponsor. In 2015, I approached the Australian College of Nursing because I wanted to re-establish Nursing in the Community Week. So today in 2021, I'm very proud to say that we are in our seventh year of highlighting and profiling the very good work that nurses do in the community. But more importantly, that our public become aware of what the nurses can do to keep people at home and that nurses find a career, a very fulfilling career for them in working in the community. What we're seeing now in 2021 is globally that people want to stay at home. It's more efficient, we're getting higher value care, uh, teams are able to work more efficiently together but more importantly, what matters to people, family and community is that they can remain in their own home. So at Regal, for over 55 years, we've had a lot of experience in working in the community, but more importantly, experience in pandemic planning, which has seen us today with 100% of our workforce vaccinated so that you don't need to worry about the nurse coming into your own home. So today we're seeing the funding bodies, the regulators, the healthcare teams that we're working with are all working together for the benefit of our community. So Regal Home Health, the founding sponsor for Nursing in the Community Week, is very happy to be supported by Medibank Private and Smith and & Nephew this year and to be partnering with the Australian Primary Healthcare Nurses Association, all underpinned by the Australian College of Nursing. So this year, a voice to lead is our theme, and we're very much looking forward to sharing our insights throughout September. Thank you. So this presentation will be recorded and available on NEO um, Nursing in Community, Community of Interest. With regards to the chat box, uh, you will be muted throughout the presentations, but you can ask your questions through the chat box and they will be um, monitored behind the scenes for you. And um, the moderator will pose questions raised to the panel. 
And finally, a um, Australian College of Nursing CPD certificate will be emailed to all attendees. Next slide, please. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the Nursing in Community uh, Leadership Team with our Chair, Kitty Hutchison. <laughs> Our, our Deputy Chair, Mr Alan Merritt, myself, Pammy as the Communications Coordinator and Secretariat. This could be you if um, you feel inspired, so please send an expression of interest into us. Thank you. Next slide, please. Vaccination outside the box aims to draw your attention to some of the most vulnerable members of our community and how nurses innovative thinking has managed to overcome many barriers and hurdles in order to continue delivery of care and compassion. I will have great pleasure in introducing you to the panel this afternoon. Next slide. Please. It gives, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Sonia Martin, a registered nurse of some 30 years. In 2017, Sonia and her friend, Dr. Nova Evans, worked in the public health system and witnessed hundreds of people consistently representing to emergency departments who were experiencing homelessness, severe poverty, mental health and drug use issues. Sonia and Dr. Evans decided to do something about this issue. In 2018, Sonia and Dr. Nova both quit their permanent full-time managerial roles and created Sunny Street. Sunny Street is a doctor and nurse led outreach service providing healthcare on the streets to those experiencing homelessness, poverty and complex vulnerabilities. In the last three years, they have had over 30 thousand conversations um, and consultations with people disengaged from mainstream healthcare services. Sunny Street also provides flu and COVID vaccinations to the vulnerable, coupling these with health education, reassurance and alleviating anxiety in the community. Welcome, Sonia. Thanks so much, Pammy, and um, thanks to the ACN and the sponsors for uh, for this webinar series on vaccination outside the box. Um, it's a pleasure to talk today, along with such fantastic um, people. Um, yes, uh, Dr. Nova Evans and I, we actually did leave our roles. Um, we saw a lot of people coming to emergency uh, with um, nowhere to sleep, um, wanting to sleep in the emergency departments, um, people with mental health issues, drug use issues, and, and really the, it wasn't the most appropriate care. Um, emergency departments aren't the most appropriate care for people who are having those kinds of issues, suicidal thoughts, um, and those kinds of concerns. Uh, and quite often, you know, they're turned around in that four hour time frame. And we found that, you know, when we looked closely at the issue, there was a major gap in emergency department care, so the public health system and, and primary health in relation to people experiencing homelessness. Um, and a lot of our patients actually, we found over the last three years, haven't been accessing uh, GP support or any kind of health care at all or attending mainstream health care. Um, quite often the transaction, it's quite a transactional experience we've found. So um, just to roll back a, a little, three years ago, we decided to start Sunny Street when we looked at the statistics around homelessness. So currently, or I shouldn't say currently, in 2016, there were over 116,000 people who are homeless in Australia. Uh, we all know that that is completely underestimated, that number. Uh, and the, the greater concern as well is that there are over 3 million people in Australia living in poverty uh, and 720,000 of those people are, are, two, are kids under the age of 24. Um, having several children myself, I have four children myself and three grandchildren and Dr Nova Evans has four children herself. Um, so eight kids between us, we thought 
we need to do something about this in our own backyard when we have these kinds of issues. So we started the service out of a, um, a car boot with uh, traditional nurses uh, community kit um, and some uh, paperwork, administration paperwork and policies and procedures um, to really try and get our teeth into um, finding out what, what's missing in that space. Um, we weren't sure initially whether people would be interested particularly in their, in their health care. Um, we thought perhaps housing and um, obviously safety needs would be paramount and they are. Um, but we found that so many people when we went out to the streets wanted to understand the prescriptions that they had, the medications, contrary indications. Um, they wanted to understand more about their, their health issues and their health concerns um, and where people had access to previous generations or you know their mum or dad's family history. We were able to really sit down and have conversations around that. So um, as you said, I mean, we spent a lot of time reassuring and um, educating people around their health. Quite often um, people say to me, um, you know, we live on the beautiful Sunshine Coast and people consistently say, you know, are there homeless people that live on the Sunshine Coast? Um, and I understand that question because the beaches are beautiful um, and quite a distraction. Uh, however, there's a lot of people that live in every community across Australia in poverty. And the other thing um, that often gets said to me is that healthcare in Australia is free. And that is very far from the truth um, when you're looking at healthcare equity issues. So typically when we started going out in the streets three years ago, we found that people experiencing homelessness had very different barriers to the average Aussie, average Australian. They had issues around transport. So getting to appointments, they had issues around affording appointments, they um, had issues around accessing bulk billing GPs, they had issues um, around health literacy, huge issues around health literacy and being able to articulate when they sit in front of the, um, their GP what their top two concerns are for that visit. Uh, and so we found, you know, quite even logistical things like having a, not having a Medicare card. Um, or, you know, it's either lost or stolen and things like that. And it is quite confronting to, to go into institutions or, um, you know, the anxiety around that is really quite concerning for people. Um, we found also, unfortunately, there was a lot of mistrust around the healthcare system as well. So we went out with our bright shirts and friendly faces and, and really tried to change that. We also moved away from a medical model and we went into um, a conversation-based healthcare model, which has really helped us roll out our vaccination programs. So obviously, um, when you're looking at the social determinants of healthcare, um, people experiencing homelessness and poverty and really complex vulnerabilities in Australia struggle to receive quality, equitable healthcare. So when uh, you're looking at issues such as unemployment, low income, you're looking at um, major stigma around being homelessness, um, discrimination, um, issues such as that, it really impacts their opportunity and their ability to gain access to healthcare. So that also then unfortunately lends into people experiencing homelessness having a higher degree of chronic disease. Um, you know, people experiencing homelessness uh, on average die 30 years um, before the average Australian who, who does access healthcare um, and their, the incidence of suicide is quite high and mental health concerns. So you can see that that picture is really quite concerning. Um, so at Sunny Street, we, we go out across Queensland, we provide outreach, but what we did in 2020, that was only just last year, it seems like a, a lifetime away, um, what we did was we actually uh, applied for um, a contract with the Department of Health with the Commonwealth to head out and provide uh, COVID vaccinations. Now, for three years, we've been providing vaccinations to people living on the streets through our, our flu program, which is funded through our primary health network. Um, but we thought, we, you know, we would step this up with, uh, with COVID testing. So up in Swanson, we have a COVID testing clinic and a vaccination clinic. We then decided to step outside the box um, and the four walls like we did originally with the health system and take vaccinations to the streets. Originally, we found a lot of hesitancy. Um, 
in those early days. Uh, there was a lot of confusion around flu shots, timing between AstraZeneca when it was the first available for the public, um, a lot of confusion. Uh, and so we found that there was a lot of word of mouth information on the streets and a lot of social media information. And if you're aware of how algorithms work, um, it's frightening. Um, so what we found we had to do uh, to think outside the box to really engage people who are disengaged was to sit with people hold space with people, take time. The paperwork around COVID vaccinations is huge, as, as no doubt so many of you know, and having the capacity to understand what the symptoms, how the symptoms relate to an individual um, is really, really difficult. So it's taken um, a, a huge step for us to head out, take the time, sit with people, sit in kindness, sit in a relationship with somebody, and, and, and take the time to make someone feel safe. It has taken sometimes weeks for us to do that. It has taken a lot of time to educate um, uh, patients who, or community members, I shouldn't say patients, I can't stand that word, um, community members out on the streets um, who really need that support. And there's a lot of misinformation. So it, it's taken us a lot of time We've also found that um, it's been helpful to have a champion. So uh, once we were able to start vaccinating, it only took one person to start vaccinating that one person um, with the COVID vaccine to then head out into the car parks with people and say, I've had the COVID vaccine and I'm still alive. It was as literal as that. Um, and have that champion out there to say, look, you can trust it. Word of mouth and trust is, is so important out on the streets. Um, so they can actually advocate to their mates. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, it's taken a lot of uh, connection. I can see I've got to wind up. <laughs> I've been talking for so long already. Um, but I mean, I think the unfortunate thing is, you know, when we've got over 3 million people living in poverty in Australia, um, and you know, we're needing to follow those public health regulations, it takes different solutions and it takes us as nurses thinking outside the box on how we can provide access, equitable access to people who are hesitant, people living in poverty and those, those groups. So it's really important to, I would say, build trust with people, um, reassure people and also educate the community, but also your team, so strong leadership, in relation to um, your team is really important. Um, since then, we've, we've um, completed over 10,000 tests in the community for COVID and over 7,000 vaccinations. So in our outreach, also in our clinics for people experiencing homelessness in the general community. So my big question for you at the end would be to think outside the box. What are you doing in your area or practice? And are you reaching the people that are most vulnerable? And, and how could you go about that? Um, are they okay? Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sonia. Um, that was wonderful to hear your message and thanks to your combined innovation, you have you know, truly made a difference to the vulnerable in our community. I loved um, how you said friendly faces and sitting in kindness. I think if we get those qualities as a nurse right in the first place, we, we build trust and from there we can really make a difference. So thank you so much for all the work you're doing. It gives me a great pleasure now, with the next slide please, to introduce Sandy Edgar who is a nurse manager in the New South Wales Refugee Health Service with experience in refugee health, emergency nursing, education and management. She holds a Master's of Research and a Bachelor of Applied Science in Advanced Nursing and qualifications in emergency nursing and advanced life support. Sandy is a Fellow of the Australian College of Nursing and has represented the college on the Detention and Immigration Health Advisory Groups providing expert advice to the Department of Immigration and Border Protection. Sandy is the immediate past chairperson of the Refugee Nurses of Australia Community of Interest. Sandy 
likes golf, Sudoku, and dogs. And she dislikes racists, bigots, and sushi. I love it, Sandy. Take it away. <laughs> Oh, look, uh, thanks uh, and for that kind introduction, Pammy, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's actually Sandy Eager, E-A-G-A-R, not Edgar, so just a slide edit for that, for your slide. Um, My apologies. And, uh, yes, I'm talking to you from COVID Central, actually, in Sydney, and uh, while we've uh, got this outbreak of COVID happening, um, if you know anything about the data in Sydney, what we're seeing is, is COVID cutting a swathe um, through the migrant and refugee communities, mainly in, in southwestern Western Sydney. And, you know, at the start, a couple of weeks ago, they were always also the communities that had the lowest level of vaccination. And like a lot of, um, a lot of communities, we found huge amounts of misinformation and distrust. Um, poor media communication initially by New South Wales Health, so that you know all messages were going out in English, for instance. Um, but coupled with the huge amount of misinformation coming in language from from offshore, and the reliance of a lot of our communities uh, on these other platforms, you know WhatsApp, Facebook, uh, Telegram, and and all the rest of them as well. So. We've had a bit of a, a two-pronged approach, really. Um, so one was trying was was getting out the information in language, and that was actually talking to specific groups with interpreters. So that was myself and my other nurses. Um, so we talked to high school students. We talked to students at TAFE. Uh, we've spoken to mothers' groups. I'm about to go straight from this uh, webinar to talk to a group of youth ambassadors for the South Sudanese community in Blacktown, uh, which uh, currently are really badly affected uh, by COVID. And look, I have to say, you know, initially our messages were fairly gentle, uh, very health education based, you know, blah, blah, blah. But really, uh, in the last few weeks, I have to say our messages have become a bit blunter. Uh, because you know what, it's actually a matter of life and death down here. Um, you know, we're not mucking around anymore. And we've had, um, ironically, some tragic, awful deaths uh, amongst our communities that has probably done more to get vaccines into people's arms uh, than, you know, all the health messaging and, and uh, all those sort of things as well. So just a couple of weeks ago, we've had a 34-year-old uh, man who arrived as a refugee you know, got through school, put himself through university, working at McDonald's. Finally, three about three months ago, ago I graduated as a lawyer and then um, died at home with COVID and left a wife and uh, three young kids. So, you know, we've also had a 32-year-old woman uh, die at home as well. So as these deaths have emerged, um, we've even, I mean, we still have the community saying, no, they didn't have COVID, they've had a heart attack. Um, but as those deaths have emerged, as I say, that actually has really uh, prompted the community to get vaccinated. Now, with the, the you know, all the rumours, you're probably all aware of the, the misinformation that uh, that is out there. So we're, we're constantly uh, battling things like, no, COVID, you know, the vaccine is not going to make you magnetic. Uh, no, it's not going to interfere with your DNA. Uh, no, it's not going to give you a connection, instant connection to 5G, but mind you, in some place in Sydney, that would be good. Um, and nor is it, uh, nor are you going to drop dead uh, the next day. Um, you know, I've had people say to me things like, but you know, my friend, she had the COVID vaccination two years ago and then she died. And I said, wow, really? She had the COVID vaccination two years, what, a year before it was invented? That was very clever of her. So, oh, okay, yeah, get your drift right. Um, so the other thing we have been doing, as I say, we've been quite blunt. So we've been calling out to the community and saying to them, so all these members in your community that are spreading these rumours and lies in Arabic or in Dinka or in Sudanese, so when someone dies, are they happy? Is that what they wanted? Are they happy now that someone is dead because they listened to them? Well, shame on them and shame on their families for letting them do it. And who is dying? You know, where is COVID? It is in your communities. Is this a coincidence, do you think? 
we don't think it is a coincidence. So, as I say, you know, the message is getting blunt. But look, when we have said it like that, I have to say we've had a huge amount of support. We've got people clapping in the background saying thank you, thank you, because someone someone had to say it. And you know, a lot of our refugees are here, of course, because of you know having terrible things happen to them in their home countries, and you know, attacked by places like you know, ISIS with, you know, with their terrorism and stuff. So we say to people, you know what terrorists do? Terrorists, they just kill indiscriminately for some ideology. They don't care who they kill. And I'm thinking that the person who's spreading all this misinformation, I don't think they care who they kill either by their words, by this ideology that they have. So would you call them a terrorist? That gets a lot of people thinking, let me tell you. In regards to getting people vaccinated, um, a lot of refugee health services around Australia will look after people seeking asylum. Uh, a lot of people seeking asylum don't have uh, a Medicare card. Now, we know that the vaccines are free, but if anyone's been on the, you know, the vaccination tracker appointment website thingy, um, well, good luck. And, uh, you know, you get to the part where you've actually got to put your Medicare number in. And if you don't put your Medicare number in, you know, the system seems to go down into meltdown. So we, we've done a few specific things in Sydney. So the first thing we did was that we've trained up our bilingual cultural educators um, in language to be vaccine uh, tracker downers. So they've helped people navigate the online portals so people can book themselves in for vaccination. And then we set up outreach vaccination clinics at spaces where the asylum seeker clients uh, go. So that's in conjunction with a lot of our non-government organisations like the Jesuit Refugee Service and the House of Welcome and Life Without Barriers and of course our mob at the uh, Refugee Health Service in Liverpool. So they were places, as I say, where people were familiar, where they knew the staff, where they trusted us. Uh, and we brought the teams uh, out to those sites and away we went. And once we've done the first clinic, that word of mouth is so, so powerful as you know our former speaker alluded to, uh, because people went back out into their communities and said, hey, guess what? I got vaccinated today and I feel like, hey, yeah, my arm is sore, but Apart from that, I feel fantastic because I'm going to be protected. And after that, uh, we've actually had people uh, knocking on our door, uh, particularly from the asylum seeker uh, community as well. Uh, the other thing that we've done with our refugee communities is that we've targeted the most vulnerable in our refugee communities, if that's possible. Uh, but that's actually our refugee families with disabilities particularly where we've got parents caring for children uh, with disabilities, and some of them are very, very complex disabilities. And so we targeted the parents uh, of those children so that we knew that if we could protect the parents, um, then they would have the, you know, a great opportunity then to protect their children. And again, that has been uh, highly successful. Everybody has returned uh, for their second shots. And now, rather than that vaccine hesitancy that we were seeing with our refugee community, then you know we're getting inquiries all the time about where someone can actually book in for their their COVID vaccine. And I have to say, you know, in regards to general vaccine hesitancy, uh, refugees are not vaccine hesitant. Um, you know, they all to, to, to get their visa to come to Australia. Everyone gets measles, mumps, rubella. Everybody gets a shot of polio before uplift, that sort of thing. And uh, and people are only too happy, only too happy, I have to say, to have their children vaccinated. They're actually highly educated about that. Uh, but we are aware in some refugee communities where their past experience with government run programs has been disastrous. Excuse me, a drink of water. Uh, that's particularly in some of the African communities. I'm not sure if you're aware, but uh, there were some African communities where um, there were sort of vaccine experiments on people in some African communities, uh, and that went on for some time. Highly unethical, you know, highly just absolutely terrible. And of course, you know, in Charlotte, that would never happen again today. Um, and you've only got to look at the experience of the some of the black uh, 
people in um, that are African Americans in in uh, the United States that were all involved in those horrible syphilis experiments uh, all those years as well, uh, where people were allowed to go on to develop um, tertiary syphilis. So, you know, communities do have long memories. Um, uh, fear of government and fear of bureaucracy is certainly part of the refugee journey. You know, that's why people are here, because their previous government have, you know, tried to kill them. Um, but Nicole, let's, I'll leave you with something on a, on a brighter note. Uh, we had a family arrive in Sydney uh, at the start of the lockdown actually last year, so they're in like home quarantine for two weeks. And I was, you know, ringing every couple of days saying, how are you going? I'm sorry, you're in lockdown. And in the end, he said to me, he said, Sandy, uh, the reason that we're here, uh, by the way, is that for three years, you know, our government was trying to kill us. So we were living in a basement. Um, and, uh, you know, now that we're here, our new government is trying to save us. And when I turn on the tap, there is water. And when I turn on the switch, there is light. And there is a television. And we have enough food to eat. And we have beautiful people like you to, to call us to see if we are okay. So he said, we are okay. Please care for someone else who might need your skills. <laughs> So um, that was a really good message for everyone whinging that they couldn't get to the beach or they couldn't go back to Bali. I thought that, um, you know, we haven't been in hiding for three years with someone trying to kill us. Okay, um, thanks very much. Thank you so much, Sandy. And that is such a powerful message to all of us that feel we're hardly done by being locked down in, you know, comfortable surrounds with all amenities at our fingertips. Um, certainly I hear your message of building trust and communication first and, and trying to um, overcome those terrible um, misdemeanours of um, social me media but through that being able to um, enable our vulnerable to access those COVID vaccinations and trust and care is just amazing. So, so thank you very much for the wonderful work that you and your team are doing. Uh, I just want to check with Odette, have we got sound? Uh, are you able to... I can't hear you Odette as yet. So Odette, I'm just going to... Um... Told? Oh, yep. Yes. Can yes. everybody hear me? Great, oh, thank you. I, I did, I'll <laughs> just introduce you. For everyone that's listening, we've had some real um, technical issues this afternoon with Odette, so it's lovely to hear her voice. Um, Professor Odette Best is a multi-Indigenous bloodline First Nations registered nurse for some 33 years. Currently, Odette is the Professor of Nursing Associate Head Indigenous Research and Community Engagement in the School of Nursing and Midwifery at the University of Southern Queensland. Odette has worked extensively across the Indigenous health clinically in Aboriginal medical services and women's prisons for the past decade. Odette is the inaugural Indigenous Nursing Director for the Office of the Chief Nurse Queensland and in the tertiary sector in schools of nursing and midwifery at QUT and USQ. Odette is currently an ARC funded in research on the histography of Aboriginal nurses from the 1890s to the 1950s, which would be fascinating. Mm. Odette is a fellow of the Australian College of Nursing, a fellow of the American Academy of Nursing, and is a fellow of the Congress of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Nurses and Midwives. Welcome, Odette. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for being so patient with the technology issues that I had this afternoon. Um, before I proceed, I um, importantly would like to acknowledge the country that we are all on and acknowledge that we are on many, many different nations um, today undertaking really important work and talking up good business about what we as nurses do. Um, I would like to acknowledge also my own elders um, and most specifically my uh, maternal grandmother who is an elder and is the only person alive that I know of that uh, managed to live through the Spanish flu of 1918. My grandmother, 
Aboriginal grandmother is about 106, we think. She has three recorded birth dates. Um, so, yeah, she's the only person that um, lived through the Spanish flu that I know of and we have absolutely locked her down um, for this current pandemic that we're going through. Um, I can really proudly say that um, I'm a community nurse being hospital trained at the Princess Alexandra Hospital up here in Brisbane. Um, I didn't like uh, hospitals and when I graduated I knew that I didn't want to work in a hospital because I thought they smelt bad. Um, and for me, I always had a burning desire and passion to work for my mob or to work for my people and so I did. So there was two ways that I thought that I could do that. One was that I had to get further endorsement. Um, so I went and got my sexual health endorsement and I became a sexual health nurse. And this led me being able to work in Aboriginal medical services and more specifically the Brisbane Aboriginal and Islander Community Health Service. And alongside that time, I also worked for in the Bogger Road Women's Prison. And Bogger Road Women's Prison now has been closed for 20-something odd years. So that's how long ago that I was doing that type of work. Um, I thought I would uh, yarn today um, about what the Archo sector has actually done during the current pandemic. So the Archo sector is the Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisations around Australia and we have approximately 143 Aboriginal medical services they usually get um, called, but uh, technically they're called Archos. Um, up until very recently, um, Australia and uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, were the only essentially two big countries with what was considered large Indigenous populations that did not have an Indigenous death um, from COVID-19. And unfortunately, that has um, changed now uh, within the last two weeks due to the current situation that's been happening out in Western New South Wales. Um, I think we are going to see um, many, many, many tragedies and many, many, many losses and many, many, many deaths, um, uh, not only in Western New South Wales, but as COVID-19 Delta variant keeps on crawling. Uh, in Queensland to date, we have not got um, data um, that uh, says that we have had any Indigenous deaths. We have had a number of uh, Indigenous people, First Nations people, who have had COVID-19, not the Delta variant, um, the Alpha variant, and they have survived or they have come through. They have now got compromised systems, but they have survived. What our Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisations did here in Queensland very quickly off the mark in 2020 uh, was that we um, made a lot of our Aboriginal medical services um, uh, have a respiratory service attached to them and the respiratory uh, services that were attached to them, which is a clinic essentially, was turned very quickly into COVID testing clinics. One thing that Archo Services did or our AMSs did that I'm incredibly proud of is that our testing clinics um, across Queensland actually weren't just available for, non uh, for Indigenous people. Um, for us, it was very, very clear and it was very, very obvious that all people needed to be tested for COVID and that many of our Aboriginal um, uh, families up here in Queensland, like the rest of Australia, do have non-Indigenous family members, whether that be through marriage, whether that be through parentage, whether that be through a whole raft of configurations. So our Aboriginal medical services made it very, very clear that we would be testing anyone who walked through the door in our respiratory clinics that got turned into COVID testing clinics. These have proven to be really incredibly successful. After vaccination became available within Australia, what we did with our art shows in Queensland is that we would continue to have testing, COVID, COVID testing in um, uh, the uh, mornings and then the afternoons it would be jabbing 
So anybody who had an arm that was shoved in front of us was jabbed. Um, and then they were deep cleaned overnight. That framework still continues to this day. I'm currently based out at Ipswich. Um, and for those who aren't familiar with Ips Ipswich, uh, we tend to throw up some freaky people in Ipswich like Pauline Hansen um, and people like uh, the the uh, young neo-Nazi um, bloke who grew up just down the road from me in Rosewood who now runs one of the largest um, neo-Nazi organisations in the States. So Ipswich can be an incredibly um, divided and contested space of a clinic, uh, of contested space of a city, and that's why we were very, very clear in making our services available for Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. However, we do not have um, across Queensland Aboriginal medical services in all our communities. Thanks, Kitty. Um, we are currently experiencing a lack of service provision to a lot of our Doggett communities or they're called our old missions and reserves. Within them, we have got incredibly poor uptake of vaccination. So one of the communities that I'm inherently linked to, Warabinda, which is in central Queensland and is a remote community, we have a 4% vaccination rate of the community. Historical mistrust of government is a huge issue for Indigenous people. And our previous speaker spoke about the history in America with the, the African-American community and the black community being used in government um, uh, research for diseases. Well, that very same thing happened here within Australia. And this is part of the untold histories that a lot of nursing nurses don't know. So for us currently in our communities is actually working within our communities that don't have AMSs because they are our absolute communities that are of critical importance in being able to immunise for COVID-19. Um, it's a large piece of work. It is a huge piece of work that we are currently working on. Um, we are currently working with Ausmat on getting uh, teams out to some of these remote communities within Queensland as we are right across Australia. And I really liked what our first speaker said, Sonia, in that it's about coming to our clients and coming to our community members with a cheerful response and a happy face. And as we call um, ears that are turned on. Uh, we have an expression in the ind Indigenous community called binangunj, and it means ears that are painted on or ears that don't hear. And that is something that we don't want the case to be in our Indigenous communities. Um, we are about to go down a very scary track for Indigenous health within Australia um, with COVID-19 due to the incredibly small and limited number of vaccination rates amongst First Nations Australians. Thank you everyone for listening. Thank you so much, Odette, and thank you for um, persevering with the technology as well. It's, it's been yet another really valuable message and it's interesting to see how the, the theme is coming through from all of you that are working with the vulnerable that we need. The, the kindness, we need the ears turned on, we need that, dare I say, basic holistic communication first. Um, and what a great initiative to have inclusive clinics. That, it, that is just wonderful, a, just a real success. So thank you very much for your messages this afternoon. And thank you also for your acknowledgement to country that we wanted in the first instance but sound proved to be the barrier but as good community nurses we've overcome that as well so we you. just kept going we did we don't give up no thank you um, thank you can I have the next slide please so welcome Alison Alison Tortell is the owner and practice manager of her own GP practice as a registered nurse in the Northwest Sydney. 
Alison um, challenges traditional nursing care and primary health. A fellow of the Australian College of Nursing, she has contributed to nurse-led models in both a national and global scale. Through her clinical leadership as a practice nurse, leader and entrepreneur, Alison encourages nurses in primary care to work to their full scope of practice and think outside the box. Thank you, Alison. Yeah. Oh, thank you, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yep. Well, I would just like to start in saying to Sonia, Sandy, and Odette, I am just in awe of you ladies. You're just doing a wonderful job. Um, I come from a different perspective, I suppose, uh, where I'll just start that. Um, I've been a I've been nurse for about 32 years and then thought my life was perfect and then worked out it's not so perfect, ended up being a single mother of three young children, went, oh, oh what am I going to do? I was sitting at home and uh, <laughs> hadn't worked for a couple of years and something popped up. Someone said, have you thought of, thought of primary care nursing? I went, what's that? Well, 15 years down the track, I know what that is and I got a great opportunity about five years ago to uh, buy into the practice I was working at. So my, um, I think we come from a, a different perspective here. Well, we are a vaccination hub now, but our issue started in March last year when, when, the, when the pandemic hit and everyone was panicking and the media were hyping it up. No one, it was very unknown. We didn't know what was coming. They were saying, lock the elderly up, the vulnerable, uh, the disabled, the special needs, and uh, that's a huge part of our, cli our client clientele were these people that were vulnerable. And then they started, what happened was in, G in the GP world that things like care plans, health assessments and diabetes clinics weren't safe to do. It wasn't safe to bring the, pa uh, the, the patients in to be doing that. So, and then what happened was we found out that primary care nurses were losing their hours, they were losing their jobs because no one was thinking outside the box how to keep, to keep, use your soldiers on the ground. And that's what we are. We are amazing. And I'm so proud to be a nurse and I'm a nurse before I'm a practice manager or an owner. I'm so proud to be a nurse. So I thought, right, what are we going to do? So we worked as a team, we talked it through. So the media started hyping it up. They're saying, get your flu vaccination. So every patient was beside themselves. They had to get their flu shot in and um, they didn't want to come into the practice and we understood that, like, I, I get it. So we thought, okay, what are we going to do? So we're very fortunate. Uh, we have eight doctors, but we have uh, then we had six RNs now, and they're all credited immunizers. And now I have eight RNs because I got two contractors in as well. And we thought, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to offer the service because luckily the government brought in telehealth. So the doctors could call the patients. Yeah, telehealth's amazing. The video, video, I love that too. That's That's coming in very handy, the video calling there. So we said to our doctors, uh, let's find our vulnerable, um, let's make a list and when you're talking to you, to our patients, let them know that we're offering a service that our, pay, our nurses are going to come out to their homes and we're going to vaccinate them. Um, and so as everyone else has said, as soon as the word got out, boy, did that list grow. And and you had to take into account our team as well. Not every nurse was comfortable in going out and, and that's fair enough because we were going into the unknown. It was very hard back then to get PPE. That was a really hard, like I had to outsource and boy, we spent some great money on that, but it was worth it. And so we, I, we did hundreds and hundreds in their own home. We had um, special needs homes so we went into there as well. But what we did was the doctor, so we would call them first, we would book them in. Because as you know, after you give that vaccination, you've got to stick around 15 to 20 minutes to make sure they're okay. And a lot of them were um, elderly couples and some elderly couples had special needs, children, that sort of stuff. So as soon as the word got out, we got the, 
doctors and the nurses, we started to identify our vulnerable, but the list just grew and grew and grew. So the wonderful part of it, so we got it all happening and, it, you know, the cold chain management, all that wonderful stuff you go through, but just the smiles on our, our people, like just, just that someone could even care to come and see them at home and we had a smile on her face. I put the mask and give them a smile and pop it back up. I went out and did it as well, and oh, I absolutely loved it. And so did so did our patients. They just loved it um, because they were frightened. And some people didn't have any relatives. They were struggling, and just that human, the compassion. And um, I must say. Our nurses, we just, because we felt quite useless, our hands are tied and frustrated because nurses are about caring. Not always about the money, it's about, well, that's why we're nurses, the compassion and we care. So getting out, seeing our patients in that way was just so rewarding and, and was rewarding for our, our patients as well, to the point that we're starting to ask, can we do it again this year? And I went, oh. <laughs> we've got our hands tied there but we we still people that are a little bit housebound or they still get out a little bit and um because you will find that most of you over 75s are still self-isolating at home especially in sydney now with what's going on but we do we're all but they're all double vaccinated the majority of our over 75s are vaccinated double vaccinated um and what we were doing too is we opened on a saturday so there was a really low traffic flow of other patients coming through and they just kept, they sat outside of our treatment room. One, we had a door that was outside and they would sit there, they'd pop in, they get vaccinated and they'd pop back out and we'd have a nurse watching them. So we had to think outside the box. We had to keep our patients feeling comfortable and we wanted to keep our nurses employed. So, yeah, that's our story. And now we're doing the vaccination hubs and our doctors will go out and if nurses need be, we'll go out and vaccinate people that are very, very anxious or worried about coming out and I don't blame them. So anyway, thank you for your time. <laughs> thank you so much, Alison, for sharing your, um, I've written down warmth and determination as a true community nurse to overcome some of the hurdles again um, to once again support the vulnerable in our community and you hear the word compassion and kindness that's what we're about that's why we're nurses and that builds the trust in our vulnerable and all communities so thank you for enabling those nurses particularly having spoken to you before and knowing how much you've put your neck on the chopping block, if you like, um, to support nurses. And as Kitty says, I love community nurses. Thank you. Um, I'm just aware that we had a bit of a late start and um, I note the time for everyone and I realise that we have many viewers. So in the interest of time, I think we um, cannot answer questions at this point of time but I'd like to thank each and every speaker for their words of encouragement, their determination and strength to enable the vulnerable in our community to feel safe and trusted and therefore access wonderful health care. Um, I invite any of our participants to continue the conversation on NEO and social media within the um, ACN platform and invite them to um, ask others to watch the video or perhaps if they have other fellow ACN members to join us next week for our next webinar. Thank you all very much and once again thank our um, sponsors Regal, Medibank, Smith & Nephew and APNA. Thank you. <laughs>